Okay, welcome in. This is the Thursday deep dive. We got Ian Gray joining us as always. We're doing this on a Saturday morning. We've got a back to back episode. So if you're watching us, uh, for the few people that watch these shows on YouTube, we will be wearing the same thing. But that is because we are recording it at the same time. I uh, do not think that we just wear the same outfits every day. But Ian, how are you doing? Are you ready to talk Constellation software? First of all, speak for yourself, man. I was gonna, I was gonna switch shirts between shows. You know, gotta paint it up, keep it fresh. Okay, but, okay, okay. Um, I'm, I'm doing well. Looking forward to talking Constellation Software today. All right. So, this is probably one of the more unique companies we've looked at in a long time. Uh, Constellation Software is essentially an amalgamation of hundreds of different VMS providers, which are vertical market software providers. So. They're basically software companies that target a very specific niche. Uh, and so it's not companies going after a massive TAM. It's like what they call mission critical companies. So for example, it's like a police force operational software, or there's one here that says a land, a global web to print estimation and production and pre-press automation workflow provider. So it's like they target one really specific objective and then just basically control that whole market and generate a lot of cash doing it. Um, and management uses that cash flow then and management is sort of well renowned in the compounder bro uh, universe or the value investing universe. Um, and we'll get into why that is, but they use that cash flow from these businesses to go out and acquire more. Uh, and so we don't know the details of every acquisition, but it's reported that Constellation is a pretty disciplined buyer and they sometimes get these companies for one to 1.5 times sales which is very cheap com comparing it to like bigger software companies that are in the public market. And the incentive for the company to sell to Constellation is for one, you get money up front. Uh, and so that's kind of the, probably the primary incentive. But then also if you're within Constellation, they talked about this on a show, I think it's called like creator story or something like that. There is a lot more up, upward mobility. So you can go, if you're like a smaller engineer and a smaller uh, one of these tinier uh, software companies, you can go and sort of work your way up within Constellation. You can kind of get to a higher position, I guess, in your career. Um, so there's that kind of incentive. And then also the businesses themselves, once they, and this is kind of a hunch, but once they implement Constellation's best practices or sort of their, I guess, keys I'm, to I'm going to push back on that a bit. I think uh, a lot of it's very decentralized. I, they let them on, they honestly sometimes let them compete with each other. So I don't know. I, I've I heard that, but then I also heard that they offer their best, best their best practices. Yeah, they, they do offer that kind of a, like a standardized thing if someone's not doing it, but they really let them do whatever they want. Okay. If I could, if I could jump in here, I think that's, I think you're, you're both right here. I think there's, they'll ultimately let them do what they want. But I think they have what I think Mark Leonard referred to as kind of a collegial environment where they're trying to have a lot of expertise across their companies. And so that people can learn things from each other and kind of naturally grow that take what's take what's good for their company and, and apply it. And that there's a lot of sharing of ideas and, and as Ryan was mentioning, best practices that really kind of help all the companies because it's like this huge built in network um, and you're probably not getting that advice from the ones you're directly competing with, but um, there's this huge net built in network of hundreds of companies that um, you can kind of learn some, learn some new tips and tricks from. Yeah. yeah the res like, or the resources are there if you want them. Yeah. I think it's like 500 companies now, 15,000 employees or something like that. It, it really is similar to the Berkshire ecosystem of kind of learning from one another. Uh, I mean, probably not exactly applied the same since all these are software and some Berkshires are more diversified. But I'll get into the history because it's pretty fascinating. So Mark Leonard, who is apparently six foot five and more than 250 pounds, uh, he played college sports uh, and he has this massive Gandalf beard. So if you've seen pictures of him, which they're kind of rare because he doesn't go out into the public eye very much, uh, you'll, you'll probably recognize him. And so he started the company in 1995, but he's a really, really private person. Apparently he had some traumatic uh, PR experience essentially. And since then he's just been staying out of the public eye as much as he possibly can. Uh, so it's hard to find any surefire facts about him, uh, but apparently he had a bunch of unique jobs prior to starting Constellation. One of those includes being a grave digger, uh, but he eventually went back to business school at the University of West Ontario, got a 
got his MBA there and then ended up getting his start in venture capital land uh, where he worked for 11 years. And as the story goes, he would see, he kind of grew frustrated with it because he'd see VC firms pass up on a lot of these VMS or critical mission, critical software companies because they didn't have a big enough time or they didn't have, I guess, big enough hopes and goals. And he's like, well, we can generate a lot of cash from these things. They can dominate their market. Um, and so he ended up deciding to try to, he got investor money. I think it was $25 million Canadian um, and started to buy up these smaller ones. And since then he's, just built this massive umbrella of tiny VMS uh, software providers. And they're kind of making a shift here, which Brett will talk about. Yeah, we'll talk about that probably on the second half. Uh, there was actually a recent letter in February 2021 talking about the new strategy shift going forward. But from 1995 to today, they've employed very similar strategy, just kept the snowball rolling and compounded the business and kept acquiring more businesses each year. All the industry and competition, pretty simple, vertical software market for SaaS, uh, the only number I could get was for the SaaS when it's valued at over $100 billion globally. If you go from not just SaaS to maybe just licensing and uh, other stuff like that, it's probably a lot bigger. So it's a huge market and it's growing quickly. We all know that the software market as a whole is growing really, really fast, Ryan. Yeah. And I, if you're wondering how many companies are out there, I've heard a figure that it's like north of five or it's like five or 6,000. Yeah, I got a number software. here. Next point. In 2017, there was an estimated 100,000 software companies worldwide, and that has likely grown substantially in that 10x over 10 years. And people are projecting it'll hit a million sometime within the next decade or two. So tons and tons of opportunities to go after. Uh, competitors, Vista Equity is another PE firm that's been huge in this, although that, that was the company that was in that tax trouble, but that might have been just the founder. They do a lot of similar stuff here. There's Roper, who is a public company. Tyler Technologies is another roll-up, I believe, for public software companies. And then there are a few other roll-ups that employ this strategy. I mean, the strategy worked really well, so there's going to be copycats out there. But within each business unit, I can't go through all of them. They really compete in a variety of markets. They compete in almost every market at this point. So there's not, you know, go on the website if you want to check it out, but that's not that important for Constellation as a whole. And if you go to, um, I guess I have a link in the show notes, it'll be on the website. Uh, if you just go to constellationsoftware.com or go to, to their investor relations page, you can check out all their companies and operating units and they basically operate in every industry. Um, all right, Ian, do you want to hit management and ownership? Yep. As we've talked about, Mark Leonard is the CEO, and that's really where the story starts here. It's um, he's a big part of this company, and it's you know he is the company in some ways, but he's also diversified kind of the responsibility of the company so much between all these different business units. And as Brett was mentioning, just allowing a lot of these companies to kind of make their own way and trying to empower leaders and growing a lot of leaders through his company. Um, and then also for a for a CEO that's as revered as Mark Leonard. Um, not a whole lot of outward kind of appearances as we've talked about. And he used to write a letter that um, was very popular each, it used to be each quarter and then it became each year. Um, ended up doing away with it because they, I think the board got on him saying, <laughs> our competitors are just taking your letters and implementing that business strategy. So he hasn't been writing them. He's just writing them now when there's um, something he feels like he needs to tell to shareholders, but a pretty low profile for a CEO that's as revered as he is. Um, one of the things there's like so many gold nuggets in his, in his letters, but just a couple of things to kind of get an idea of, um, the, his mindset and a couple of things I think are worth sharing is one is he isn't a fan of mission or vision because he said it's been proven how bad humans are at projecting the future. We're so bad at like having any sort of vision of the future. So he doesn't want to have a vision, but he likes the idea of an objective. So he says the constellation software, he says, our objective is to be a great perpetual owner of VMS businesses, vertical market software. Um, so they really are positioning themselves and it's from his you know, I don't want to call it a vision, but his objective from the beginning has been to be a perpetual owner and not the traditional PE um, model of taking a company like this, growing it for five to seven years and then flipping it at a higher multiple. Yeah. Um, that, that's not what he's doing. And I don't know if they've ever sold a company, um, but they like to be perpetual owners of these VMS businesses. And then he's also said in these letters that he doesn't see an upper limit to the number of businesses that they can have and that they can buy. And a lot of people start to think, at a certain point, the more businesses you get, the less ability you will to 
you'll have to manage them um, properly. He doesn't really worry about managing them properly, at least from what I can see. He's trying to build up leaders and grow them so that there's just constantly leaders who can manage the businesses and they don't need oversight from someone in the central office. Um, that's a little different than what I'd call the, the Berkshire model. And it's not, it's, it's similar in some ways, but it's a little bit different that they've, they've focused on a little bit bigger acquisitions and having a little bit more oversight and probably a little more sharing of best practices. Um, and, and I would say in the Berkshire model, there's probably more of a, I would say that, and you guys may disagree with me, that there's probably more of an upper limit on the number of businesses that Berkshire wants to own. They don't want to own, you know, 500 businesses. Yeah, Buffett so, wants to know each one of them in and out. And right. Leonard doesn't, he on no. like he said, I think once they got over like 50 or 100, I forget what the, the threshold was. He said, all right, I got to change it up. All I'm going to do is worry about the acquisition for the big ones and then training these people to do what I used to do, which is, you know, be in charge of 20 different units and then just keep spawning those over and over. It's kind of a, it's pretty ingenious. <laughs> it's a really good strategy. Yeah. And, and they've, they've had success with it, I think, um, and really training these leaders. And like you said, you know, they, they train these leaders to be the head of these business units or these former companies. And then slowly, then they, those companies are kind of the lead and saying, oh, we think buying this company would be great for the business. And then all of a sudden that person who was just leading that one company starts leading, you know, looking over two, three, four, five, six, you know, 20 companies. So um, one other thing that I think makes this strategy work well is they've laid out very clearly their acquisition criteria. So they talk about what makes an exceptional business and that's um, mid to large size vertical market software companies with a minimum of a million dollars in earnings and consistent earnings growth, experience and committed management. Um, and then also good businesses. And they say there's not very many exceptional businesses, but they have exceptional businesses and good businesses with criteria laid out, which I think makes it easy for him to kind of set, this is the standard, this is what we want. They have, um, they talk about their hurdle rates all the time. And once people are given the parameters and kind of the rules to play in, um, making these acquisitions and growing these businesses is something that becomes kind of on them, but they have kind of the guidelines, but then they can, you know, they can, they can do it how they see fit basically. So, yeah. Um, and what's interesting too, is that the head office, which is, that is very similar to the Berkshire model. I think they have like 15 or 20 people there. It is Leonard and the team up there, probably, you know, accounting, CFO, stuff like that, but they give capital allocation capabilities to the the sub people which are called i believe the operating managers i forget the exact term but the people below them have the capital allocation capabilities they've even pushed that down so it's even more decentralized than berkshire hathaway where i believe and maybe greg gable is doing this at berkshire hathaway now too where almost all the capital allocation is from one person leonard has really pushed that down and that takes a lot of trust and it's actually worked out beautifully Right. It's amazing to see what's happened. So some final quick notes. Um, he's got about a $2.4 billion net worth. So um, his uh, it, constellation has been good to him. Um, he doesn't take a salary anymore. And part of the reason he says for that is uh, he doesn't want to feel the responsibility of like working super long hours for the shareholders, basically. He's like, I just want to help where I can help and not feel some sort of burden about working a ton more hours because I take a salary. Um, and then he he currently and this is this was data as of um, early 2020 owns about two percent of the company. We still haven't gotten the the equivalent of a proxy in in 2021 yet. So um, it's it's unclear how much he's bought or sold. At least I haven't I I didn't dig into a lot of research, but he owns about two percent of the company currently. Yeah, and ownership with this company is not something. If you read the letters, they've really set it up so they want the ideal shareholders. I don't think ownership is something to dig into too much here, but I'll move forward. We'll hit valuation quick. Market cap uh, as of recording is $32.7 billion. And these are all going to be in US dollars. Make sure if you're looking at Coifin or whatever, you're going from whatever country you want because you can get tricked because the Canadian dollar has a similar sign. Uh, ticker is CSU.TO for Canada. And then if you're in the US and only have access to the US markets, it's CNSWF for the U.S. Enterprise value is slightly higher than the market cap at $33 billion. EV to sales trailing is 7.87. EV to free cash flow is 25. That is according to Coifin. Uh, they do some internal stuff that kind of mixes, you know, they do some non-GAAP adjustments. So 
take a look and kind of pick and choose whatever one you want. In one of his letters, they kind of Leonard so that they really they well, they have a slight disagreement. Some people like net income within their company, but he says that he tracks free cash flow per share growth. Um, so that's maybe the best way to look at it because that's what the management is going to try to do and, and maximize as well. Dividend yield is there. It's actually at about 0.21%. And then share count has stayed very flat. So the capital returns, you know, they got the dividend there, but it's not really relevant right now. And then share count, you're not going to have to worry about that. They actually try to keep it as flat as possible. They don't want to use share. Uh, well, maybe, the, I don't know, maybe they'll change that in the future, but they don't like buybacks um, because they don't want to get rid of their long-term shareholders. Uh, so they, they try to optimize keeping that share count flat, at least they have in the past. And then fun fact, um, if you want to <laughs> get angry at the opportunity that aroused and maybe do a little hindsight bias here, from 2008 to 2012, that was a five-year period where you could buy shares at a 6% free cash flow yield or higher during that time period. So Hindsight, that was a pretty good deal. Um, it was more of an unknown company then, but kind of interesting. That's why it's been such a good stock over the long term. All right, Ryan, you want to hit earnings? Yeah, I will. Are, are you sure on that enterprise value number? Because I believe they have a net cash position. Uh, that's I just used the coin fin number. Um, could be slightly off. Either way, it's not a huge difference there, but uh, it, it looks like they. Uh, Ian, you'll get into it, but it looks like yeah. they have a cash position, right? All right, um, it's a little complicated, but I'll get into it. I'll talk about 2020 earnings. And so there really isn't a lot to cover here just because, I mean, the only numbers that, that seem to matter to them is revenue and free cash flow, but I'll try to break it down a little bit more. Uh, so they had $3.97 billion in revenue last year, up 14% year over year, so roughly $4 billion. And they break down the revenue into four parts. So it's licenses, professional services, hardware, and other, and then uh, maintenance and other recurring revenue. The maintenance and other recurring revenue, I think, makes up I'm blanking on the percentage, but it makes up the majority of revenue by a lot. And then they have free cash flow of almost a billion dollars. That's up 68% year over year. And so that's roughly 25% free, free cash flow margins in 2020. Uh, and since they use those business, uh, that business cash flow to acquire and you know get into this, they run a pretty lean balance sheet. And so, uh, and then as Brett mentioned, it looks like share count has stayed steady. So when you look at free cash flow, uh, free cash flow per share growth is probably going to be exactly in line with free cash flow growth. Uh, and then organic revenue growth was actually negative during 2020. So keep in mind, they have, it's not just like they acquire these businesses and they die. They are obviously hopefully growing in their own right. Uh, but this was, their growth was negative during the year because COVID kind of threw a wrench in sales practices for a lot of their portfolio companies. Usually, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's not negative growth. It's usually pretty low, but yeah, not, they say their goal is, uh, in best case scenario, like mid single digits, uh, but they're not gonna be upset if it's lower. Uh, it's really small. Most of the contribution to growth is from the acquisitions and some of it is from that organic revenue growth. It's kind of like a mature, a retailer where you might get tiny or you know maybe a fast growing retailer where you might get tiny amounts of comp sales growth but a lot of it is just expanding and acquiring new stores if that's kind of a similar analogy for someone to use yeah that yeah, makes sense uh ian balance sheet yep the balance sheet is like you said fairly light for the size of a business they've got cash of 932 million dollars um which is up from $364 million in the quarter a year ago. So they've really been growing their cash balance recently. And um, and I think we're gonna get into this later, but they, they might start using that cash a little more aggressively. They've got debt, and this is, this is a number that you probably wanna do a little bit more research on if you're gonna buy this company. But I think the proper debt number is about $400 million. And I was using kind of management's discussion about this as well. Um, the debt on the balance sheet would say it's higher than that. From what I can tell, it looks like they're reporting um, an undrawn line of credit on their balance sheet. And so that makes it look like they have a net debt position um, and that they've got more debt than they actually have drawn currently. Like I said, you're gonna wanna do a little bit more research on that from what I can tell though, and what from management's discussion of it in the financials, uh, that seems to be what's going on. So what that means is if that's correct, they've got a net cash position of about $533 million. Um, the interest rate on the debt that is that is out there is a little bit high for like some debentures they have. Um, it's inflation plus six and a half percent. So 
you know, it, it's a little bit high, but the amount of debt relative to the market cap is very low. So it's not a huge concern. They've got plenty of cash flow. Um, this is definitely not a, a business you're worried about uh, <laughs> going under having having a credit problems. So um, one other thing I'll note is there's some preferred stock on the balance sheet that pays about a 5% dividend um, that accumulates. And then when the shares are converted, um, then it gets paid out. It's related to the spinoff of an entity called Topicus, which is, it looks like that's their Euro-based businesses. And presumably that was for, um, they just decided that that was a better structure. They still um, have ownership in those businesses from what yeah, I can tell. I, got, I, I can kind of explain, okay, I'll try to read up on the Topicus one. It was a big acquisition they did and it is based in the Netherlands. And it was, I believe in 2013 or 2014, one of the larger acquisitions they did at, uh, at least for the time period. Uh, but the management team there apparently wanted, uh, they didn't want to get bogged down within the, in the constellation ownership anymore. So they wanted to do their own thing. So now they're going to run something separately, but constellation still is connected to them through an ownership. So that's why they decided to split off and spin out some shares, uh, for the existing shareholders. And it's kind of interesting. Maybe they'll start doing that more kind of going for an IAC strategy. Yeah, that would be interesting. And, and one of the things also to note on some of the financials is now it's listed um, that they do have a non-controlling interest, which is something new this year um, based on this spin out. So uh, the last thing I'll say is <laughs> the balance sheet, it's, it's hard to get super um, granular in this balance sheet and really try and pull out a lot of insights. There's, there's some work you can obviously do, but given how vast the enterprise is and how many different companies are actually within it, there's, um, it, it's not just like a simple, it's not just a simple like software company balance sheet in some ways because they also have this capital allocation strategy. So um, it's it's an interesting business. Balance sheet looks good though. It's interesting that they don't, they seem to be against taking out long-term bonds, right? Because you would think they'd be able to get, you know, a 10-year bond at, uh, in this interest rate environment, you know, at least three, 4%. I don't know, a flat one because they're going to continue doing these acquisitions. Is that- What do you mean? Like take out a, you know, I don't know, like every other company in the U.S. has been doing, we're going to take out a 2032 note at 2.8%, but they're taking this high interest rate debt. They seem to have an aversion to the bonds, which seems interesting to me. I'd, I'd like to know why. They've got a, yeah, I mean. It, I think it's probably just that they have so much cash right now. Yeah, right? You know, but if they cash. have this other debt, I don't know. Yeah, those are so that other debt is and we'd have to dig deeper into it to see if they could retire it early. Um, I suspect maybe they can't. But that other debt was created in 2013 and 2014, I believe that there's part of it, the debentures. Um, and those have a are they're basically, you know, kind of long term bonds in a, in a sense. So um, those those expire in uh, 2040. So, OK, um, so those are those are long term, but they might not be able to get they might not be able to refinance. Right. They, that's the question is we, we'd have to dig a little deeper, but um, they may not be able to refinance those. Yeah, okay, this seems like the exact kind of business they would get an extremely low rate. I know. And maybe they don't need it anymore, like you were saying, Ryan. But if they're going to take out debt, that's the only question. You can really lower your interest rate um, here. But who knows? They seem, to, they seem to go about everything in a unique manner, uh, which we'll get to more in the second half of the show. Let's take the ad break and then we'll get back to it. Okay, welcome back. Next up, we have anecdotal evidence. Ian, we'll kick things off with you. I'm going to start with a podcast episode I actually listened to just a, a couple nights ago. So Mark Andreessen was on Invest Like the Best and was talking about venture capital and, and some of the strategies and how Silicon Valley really got started. And one of the things he was talking about was Hewlett Packard and how Hewlett Packard started developing all these different business units and had this environment that in a lot of ways, as I was reading through the Constellation uh, shareholder letters, it, it seemed like a very similar type model. I think what, what uh, Constellation Software has been able to do though is decentralize it even more than Hewlett Packard did and give people more ownership over their own units because what he really spoke about is that VC got going because they had all these people working at Hewlett Packard who'd been just getting money from Hewlett Packard and running their business unit. But then VC came in and said, hey, what if we just gave you a bunch of money and you did it on your own? And um, in some ways, I think that's what Constellation Software has, has gone even further that model, but still trying to provide that kind of collegial environment to, to share a lot of information, to share ideas, to, to have some of those benefits of a larger organization within these small vertical 
uh, market software. So anyways, if you're interested in this business, I think that episode, like I said, it's, it was a recent episode on invest like the best with Mark Andreessen, definitely worth a listen. Yeah. The keeping the people around and not getting these groups to want to spin off. Cause I bet there's other people like Topicus uh, that want to have their own ownership and people there's probably PE firms that pitch them. Hey, let's spin you off. You can do your own thing. But the way they've set it up is giving people full autonomy. And I believe they say they've created, you know, over a thousand millionaires within Constellation software. So they try to keep these people around by paying them extremely well. They give them ownership of Constellation software through some of these deals. Uh, I don't know. It seems like, yeah, it's a, it's a smart strategy to try to keep them away from BC. Um, all right, Ryan, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, we typically for this segment do product experience slash anecdotal evidence. And seeing as these are mostly business to business, mission critical softwares, I have no experience with any of the products. Uh, but as far as kind of just anecdotal evidence with uh, CSI or Constellation software at large, I like... I tend to like when CEOs are reserved and stay out of the media. Uh, and Mark Leonard really, really does that. But that's, I guess that's only if the financials kind of follow up. Like if you're doing this and you're, if you're not in the media and you have a terrible business, then it's probably more of a red flag. Yeah. It's I mean, he's just, just so, like, like Ian said, he's so well revered. Uh, I really, the corporate structure here, I could not find a flaw. Oh yeah. I mean, I put low, low light. I got no low lights on this company. I mean, Angel for me, I'd probably say, I mean, this is the 21st century, you know, Berkshire Hathaway. It's, um, yeah, it could probably, I don't know who knows what's going to happen at the end, but it, it, it's on a track that it could have better returns. I think they were at a 28% CAGR, but as they scale, that might, that might slow down. Um, all right. Future growth opportunities, Ian, kick things off. This is something they talked about in, in uh, a recent letter, but they're talking about trying to get into more larger acquisitions and they haven't done a whole lot of large acquisitions in their past. Most of them have been, um, you know, three, five, eight, $10 million acquisitions. But Mark Leonard has identified that there are some opportunities for um, more of that 200, $300 million acquisitions, that there's a lot of those out in the market. And then as they've gotten larger and have the cash and also need to continue to generate returns for people, um, that those, those larger acquisitions can become a, a possibility for, um, for growth for them. Now, one thing that concerns me about this is that they have not had, at least in the last couple of years, a very, and even historically, they have not had very good organic growth. And so as they bring in these larger acquisitions, um, I worry that that, I just, I, I, I worry about the operational effectiveness of some of them and whether these larger acquisitions are really going to be incorporated well, or if they're just going to kind of be a, a more of a drag on the company. But um, that is, that is something they seem to be getting into and something that I would be excited about as a shareholder for them to get more into larger acquisitions. Yeah. It adds, it's, it's interesting, but it does add new variables, new, a little more uncertainty. Um, Ryan, what's your future growth opportunity? Uh, so I guess there isn't there isn't a whole lot you can say for this that's like revolutionary for the business because it's a pretty simple strategy. But this is something they talked about in their most recent shareholder letter, which was cutting the dividend. Um, and he, like this was the very first paragraph that he talked about this and he's finally kind of caving in on it, which was uh, Constellation is able to invest the capital more effectively than the shareholders because of the position they're in. Uh, and so for the one of the board members is like, we shouldn't be giving the dividend if we can effectively invest that capital better. Uh, and he finally caved, I guess. So they are apparently cutting the dividend. Uh, this was in the 2021 update, right? Yeah. And it's it starts with like, we're cutting the special dividend because they used to do these infrequent special dividends. Um, uh, and so I guess just keeping that cash flow to themselves, reinvesting it at higher rates of return, that's probably better for shareholders in the long run. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and I'll hit mine. Uh, they talk about this in the 2021 letter as well. If they didn't have that 2021 update, we would have nothing to talk about here. So good that they did that. Uh, but it was the other big thing they talked about in that letter, and it's moving outside of BMS, which again is vertical market software. Um, they were thinking about if you're so confused on what vertical market software is, or is it market? 
It's yeah. market. Okay. Yeah. It's market horizontal software. The epitome of that is Excel, which is for everyone. Vertical is for specific niches. Uh, and then in the recent letter, they said that they're actually going to try to establish a new circle of confidence. So this is the first time in its history constellation is going to be moving outside of VMS. It will definitely be risky, but interesting to see what they come up with. Who knows? It could be anything. I hope it's not meme stocks or anything like that, or crypto, maybe that might turn some shareholders. I have a way. feeling it won't be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't know. Yes, I have no guesses of what it'll be since they're kind of they're such a closed book. But watch them just go Berkshire, public equities, maybe. Public equity pub yeah, they did do some public equities in the early two thousands, I think. I think. Uh, I'm not correct. I'm not entirely sure on that. I think it was just it might just be bigger software companies. Well, no, this is a different part of it. Like, di- like, it's outside, right? Because we we read that update, right? They talked about they're going into large VMS more. Like, they're going to do more of the topic oh, is outside. outside of and this large? was outside of this. They said we're trying to establish a new circle of competence outside of VMS. So, who knows what that is? But I feel Forex. like the shareholders were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is too much for this two-page letter. This is the first thing we see in four years, and you're you're throwing all this stuff. And on. it doesn't help that it's cloaked in secrecy because yeah. now we're not. We might not know what that new circle of competence is yeah. for another four years. Yeah, but they they do have annual general meetings. I don't know if they're recorded. They could talk about that stuff there. I might watch the recent one. Um, Maybe it's see what they no say. No phones policy there. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of the Canadian Berkshire. They keep it all secret. I might want to go to one of these meetings sometimes, but. Uh, let's move on. Don't want to go too long here. Highlights and lowlights. Ian, what do you like and dislike about this business? So the highlights for me, and we've touched on this, but it's a genius strategy. They've got a proven track record um, and and likely just, you know, tens, if not hundreds of, of good managers and capital allocators, right? They just, they've really done a good job of building, building out this network of business units. The other thing is just the high free cash flow per share growth returns on invested capital, all those numbers that you love to see, they've just been compounding for years and years and years. Um, a couple of lowlights for me actually is just, especially in recent years, but even going back, they've never, they've traditionally not had very good organic growth with these acquisitions. Um, that hasn't seemed to hurt the stock or their returns. They've been able to generate cash flow, but the revenue growth has not been there, which which says to me they, they've really focused on operational efficiency and have not been good at growing these companies at, at massive clips. I wonder if that's something inherent in some of these vertical software businesses that you kind of hit your niche and then um, kind of stall out a little bit for lack of a better word, you kind of get a, get a, a base of, of companies and install base and then slowly, you know, those companies go out of business and they kind of decline a little bit um, in their in their revenue, or there's just not new opportunities to sell to new companies, or there's other software that comes along and starts, you know, picking up the new clients. So I, it, I assume that there's, there's some level of that that's inherent in vertical market software, um, and especially at the size of the companies they're growing or they're, they're buying. If I, if they were, if they were to start acquiring more larger brands, I would definitely want to see the organic growth higher because it, they can make it work when it's these smaller brands, I think. But if they started making bigger acquisitions and the organic growth wasn't there, that'd be a little bit concerning to me. And then this is just a question for me as they start to move towards these larger acquisitions potentially is, are they beginning to grow out of their comfort level? And how does that affect the business going forward? That it seems like going forward, whether it's through new lines, new circles of competence, um, or just to larger acquisitions, I wonder a little bit about are we, is this business going to still be able to kind of keep the same structure, the same units, um, and and really generate the same success that it has in the past? Because it's just a, it's it's reached a level of scale now that's um, changing what they can do. Yeah, yeah, that's because the their old model. Some of the re, one of the reasons why they were so successful is because they went after things that most VCs or I guess all VCs wouldn't touch, which is stuff that may have declining revenue growth or just total stalled out revenue growth and stuff that was tiny. And there was no one else fishing in that pond. Now they might be going to areas where there's a ton of demand. Right. There is, there is more demand. And then the other thing I'd say um, is each of those acquisitions, they've said that, that they don't think there's an upper limit on the number of acquisitions they can make. And I agree with that, that like, I think they could continue to grow out these small businesses and just keep, keep going out. But 
the, the reality is that each of those acquisitions becomes less and less impactful as the organization gets bigger and bigger. And so there's not an upper limit in terms of how many they can manage, I think, but they're starting to become an upper limit on how many, if they can actually acquire these businesses fast enough to generate meaningful returns for investors, if organic growth is going to be flat. Um, so that's, that's, that's my low light and my concern. Yeah. yeah. They are good, right? That's my low light as well, because there aren't a lot of low lights with the actual business itself, but just what does, what a size, end up doing to the business in the long run. I think they were talking about this in 2013. So we may be laughing at ourselves in 2030 with this one, but I mean, it it will, I'm always thinking about it too. Highlights for me, uh, obviously Mark Leonard's an exceptional capital allocator uh, and there's not really any threat from the competition of like big tech. Whereas a lot of these other software, bigger software companies with huge TAMs or whatever, they tend to get that competition from Microsoft, stuff like that. I mean, think about the company I, that comes to mind is like Slack uh, with the, I, the competitor teams, you know? So like, there's just not that much interest from big tech to go after these tiny verticals. Um, so I think it's a bit of an advantage for them. I mean, there's highlights across the board. The corporate structure is perfect. Yeah. And I'd say maybe the way they're going <laughs> to counter the bureaucracy and the size is just by spinning off stuff and making like, I, I know Topicus will probably still have connections to Constellation software and Constellation shareholders still own it. I don't know the exact structure, but you just package, package, package the companies and ship them out. Right. Just, yeah. Like it, maybe that's the way they're going to do it is spin out stuff like Topicus or, or maybe they won't, but like if Topicus is its own thing, they go about, you know, Leonard has, and I bet the managers there were good beforehand, but Leonard and the people at Constellation Software have trained these people to become really good at what Constellation does. And now they can go repeat it in their own way. It could be in another way, just uh, as this kind of spawning type deal. It's it's very interesting, uh, but they've, they've been able to evade any bureaucracy uh, and we'll see if they can do it because it's going to keep being a headwind for them. Um, Let's see, highlights for me. Yeah, I mean, the decentralized structure stuff I like and just the ability that they've compounded cash flow per share. They give out operating cash flow per share, which is very similar for a company like this because there's minimal capex on a lot of these things. So in around a 15-year time period, operating cash flow per share went from around 10 cents to like $50 a share in 15 years. It's just really strong. That's a crazy number, right? The only thing I can think of is like, you know, John Rotanti of the fool always, when, when you see a number like that, he goes, fools, that is compounding. You know, yeah. <laughs> like that, that is, that is, that is crazy right there, right? 10 cents to $50 in 15 years. You talk about a compounder. Yeah. It's a hundred bagger, isn't it? Uh, it is a hundred bagger. Um, if I was, if Koifin is not lying to me as it may have lied on, on the debt. So we'll see. I think, I think it's a hundred bagger. If not, it's close and it will be soon. Um, all right, let's move into bull case. This one will be a little maybe boring as well, but Ian will kick things off with you. What are your thoughts? Yep, I'd say for the bull case, the way I see it going is they pivot to larger acquisitions. It works. They are able to continue compounding capital as they have been with those smaller acquisitions. And it just starts at a larger scale and it kicks off a whole new um, cycle for Constellation Software. Um, Instead of these seven figure acquisitions, they're making great nine figure acquisitions and really incorporating them well, continuing to maintain that structure and just continuing to compound capital at great rates, benefiting shareholders for years to come. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's uh, something that I heard recently, I think it was on a podcast covering Constellation was new development tools have made creating these niche software solutions a lot easier. And so it's kind given, of a, what is that like the no code Twilio types like Twilio and stuff like that? Yeah, I think, it, or maybe not. Maybe the not. process of the engineering process, I think, has just gotten more democratized. Okay, it might be years. not Twilio, something else. Uh, yeah, it's probably over my head to be honest. But uh, if it's easier now, I could see how that creates a bigger pile for Constellation to choose from. Um, and so, if the pile is bigger than I think, then they can continue the exact same track they've been uh, doing here for the last what is it, 15, 20 years now? Yeah, uh, 25. No, uh, 25. Started yeah, 1996. 1995. Uh, they're older than all of us. So, 
It's been 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 compounding. They've been compounding since we've been in the womb. Uh, So for existing (laughs) shareholders for my bull case, I mean, if you're an existing shareholder, you've been around and see a 10 bag or 50 bag or 40 or something like that, I mean, you probably just want them to keep doing what they're doing. Like you're not going to, I mean, if you're already at that point, you're not going to complain if they only compound at, you know, eight to 10%, if it it just drops a lot, like they might with the, uh, while they scale up here. But if, if you're thinking of buying here, you know, at a higher valuation than it historically has been, um, I would look closer at the VMS purchases, or sorry, the larger ones that they're going to get into. And then this new circle of competence, whatever that ends up being, that's going to be a big driver if you're looking for outsized returns from the stock going forward. So yeah, just looking at that, right, bear case. I know we've been, you know, very bullish as uh, like on the business itself, but what could go wrong for the company going forward, do you think, Ian? So I'm thinking for the bear case that, I just wonder about these vertical, and I touched on this earlier, but whether these vertical market software companies and these these niches that they're attacking, whether those businesses are just declining in general across the board, um, are some of those software solutions dying out because of one, more consolidation in the industry? You're getting these massive ERP players, whether it's like Workday, SAP, um, NetSuite, uh, Oracle, all these all these players that are just continuing to add more and more capabilities to their software, which I have to imagine starts impacting even some of these vertical niches because they just are adding more and more products to their general suite. And so that someone can just buy one, one software that covers everything they need to do. Um, the other thing I start to worry about, and I think the other solution to some of these and, and could create a little bit of a bear case here, is low code. And, and Ryan mentioned this a little bit, but if there's truly companies and like one company that does this is Appian, but if there's truly companies that can go in and help you build your own solution for whatever problem you're having that's customized to what you need within you know a month or two, and you can just buy your own solution that works exactly for your business, some of these niche vertical market software companies, I think start to be less attractive because you can just get your own solution fairly quickly up and running that's customized, not just for your niche, but actually for your company. So between those two things, I think there, there is a bear case here that the vertical market software is just a little bit of a, that it's not going to grow at the same rates that it, that it has historically, and that there's going to be some other options here instead of some of these small software companies. Yeah, that's interesting. The low code stuff, I hadn't, hadn't thought of that. Um, Ryan, what's your, what's your bear case? Well, it's the one we talked about, which is how does size play a role for them? Obviously they can keep doing what they're doing, but then they have to increase the volume of their transactions. So probably start to have to buy north of a hundred companies a year. Um, That probably presents maybe a few issues, but then, or they have to expand, I guess, into that new circle of competence, which presents, I guess, some uncertainties. I just think the old playbook will eventually no longer be as valuable. Uh, they're going to have to change. Uh, if if anyone, if I were betting on whether or not Mark Leonard could change, I would say he probably can. Um, yeah. And what's interesting is that this was probably the bear case in 2013 or whatever. I'm just using that as a random time where, you know, the old strategy, it's been going for 10 years and might not work in the future. And that's why there was that opportunity. It's strange. I don't know if it's true. Eventually it might, you know, eventually it's got to be true on a long enough time horizon. But yeah, I don't, I mean, the, the margin of safety is pretty high here. Like there's a high floor given that they generate so much cash from their existing businesses. Yeah. And they've said that they're going, if they can't find any opportunities, they're going to just return the cash to shareholders. So, I mean, if anything, you're going to just get special dividends. Plus the other thing I'd add is like with the, like the small verticals or like the sort of niche verticals, you have customers who just don't want to switch. Like it's just such a hassle for them to switch. So I guess the example that I heard earlier is like uh, you have like a bowling alley operating system. Let's say that's like the software, like your bowling yeah, alley. Like a few thousand places or something. Yeah, it's too costly for them to switch. It's too much of a I guess pain in the ass for them to like retrain employees on a different software. So they just keep these old VMS providers, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, all right, two things that come to mind for me. I I mean I, no. no None of these things that we're talking about, I don't think are going to be detrimental, but I think can be a headwind. So if acquisition prices creep up, uh, as they've said before, that their hurdle rate, they have, it's been harder and harder for them to hit their hurdle rate on acquisitions. And as more of the private equity industry 
you know, comes into this as they have in the past. Um, if that continues to grow, that'll be a headwind. And then the new acquisition strategy just doesn't work out as well. That's, I mean, they're taking a risk here. It's something that they probably are forced to take because they've been so successful, but it just adds a slight amount of risk going forward. You know, they're not guaranteed to execute on that. So it's not like this is a, no stock is a sure thing. And Constellation might seem like the closest thing to it, but it's not a guarantee. Um, all right, Ian, you have something? I just, I just wanted to make a comment real quick. So many of our listeners, I'm sure, probably will know what a hurdle rate is, but we've mentioned it a few times, so I just want to be clear, and they talk about it a lot. So a hurdle rate for them is they say, what is the rate of return that we project forward from making this acquisition? And is that higher or lower than the return we demand? So when we make an acquisition, for instance, they might say, we want it to return 20% each year. Um, if an acquisition, if they model it out and say this acquisition is only going to return us 12%, then they won't do the acquisition. So, and those are just made up numbers, but that that's kind of the idea. And that's what, the, the, when they talk about a hurdle rate and when we talk about a hurdle rate, um, that's what we're talking about. So that they're, they're having a harder time seeing really high sustained returns that they, that they demand um, in many of these acquisitions that they're making, which is a result of price oftentimes. Yeah. And their strategy, they've, it's the, and why we don't have any uh, real numbers on that is because they don't give it out. It's part of the secret sauce that they try to keep in house. It's like the Coca Cola secret secret formula in that regard. All right, let's wrap things up. More or less interested, Ian. This one's actually a little bit tough for me, so I'll say I'm a little bit more interested. But it's more because of the story of this company and like what has happened historically. It's just been so impressive, and they've compounded capital. Like it's hard to it's hard not to be more interested in this company just in the way that they've done it and, and Mark Leonard's um, run a success here. My concerns though about the vertical market software industry, um, kind of that's that's what brings down my interest a little bit. Is I'm just not convinced that that's an industry um, that I want to be in going forward. Uh, so durability for, concerns. Durability concerns. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Okay, uh, Ryan. Sorry. More interested. It seems like the kind of company, like we're going through all these sort of bull case, bear case scenario planning right now, where if you just held it and looked away for the next 10 years, like I think you generate a decent return. Um, yeah. And I guess it's hard not to be more interested just given how much about the business I actually like. The price isn't terrible. Um, yeah. It's, you know, it's not, I said the valuation has crept up. It's not as high as it has been in the past. That could be some timing issues with 2020. There could be some cash things that smooth yeah. themselves out. Stocks close to all time high, but the free cash flow yield is not. It's still a lot lower than it has been. And I don't think expecting another hundred bag would be, I don't know, that, that seems, seems audacious. Like the company is very large. And, but you don't need a hundred bagger to make a good return. I mean, this thing, I don't know, like 10, 12% a year. I mean, that's fantastic. feels a bit like, I don't know, Berkshire in like 97. If it could be, yeah, that was something or 98 where, I mean, 98 is when it kind of got that overvalued and or I can't remember that same time period, right. Where they, yeah. um, you know, the success has been so strong. People may have crowded into the stock. They do some interesting deals. I mean, and that's when they did that, uh, kind of surprising deal with Gen Re. I guess we don't need to go into all, all, all that whole deal, but um, I'm more interested. I don't, I think you have to put this on your watch list. I don't know if you, if you read about the company, it's kind of one you want to keep in your back pocket. It's one that if there's a huge market downturn, feels like something like that. Sure bet. Feels like, yeah. Feels like that. You got to be worried. I don't know. I get worried when I ever think about, wow, there's just nothing wrong with this company because things can always go wrong, but definitely more interested. Um, stock for next week, which we're going to be recording right after this. But Ryan, it's, you wanna... it's Robin Hood, our favorite mm. broker. Uh, we're going to go through the S1. I know how much a lot of people hate it. It's actually, you know what? There's Well, some people like it. Some yeah, people some it. people like it. I would almost call it uh, one of those, what's it called? Stocks, uh, battleground, stock. Stock. battleground stocks. Battleground yeah. stocks. It surprisingly, I thought most, I thought it was consensus that we didn't like it. But. I thought it, was, yeah, I thought it was consensus at least in like the wrong. the investment fund community and like the financial advisor community. I guess those are the people we follow on Twitter a lot. Some people actually, I'm in my own bubble. Silicon Valley loves them. Yeah, yeah. Well, they have a lot of MAUs. <laughs> uh, all right, sorry. All right. all right, sign us out. Yeah. All right, that's gonna do it for this episode. Thank you all for listening. Make sure to excuse me. 
Remember, we are not financial advisors. Anything we say on the show is not formal advice or recommendation. Ryan and I are general partners at Arch Capital. Arch Capital clients may hold securities discussed in this podcast. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. 